What is up, Watch Fam? I am Christian from Theo and Harris. Happy Sunday, and welcome to this week's uh, Ask TNH Live. Uh, we are also on YouTube, uh, so YouTube, say hi to Instagram, Instagram, hi to YouTube. Um, happy Saturday for you guys. Uh, if you do not follow us already, I highly recommend you do, at Theo and Harris. Uh, that way, you'll get a push notification when we go live, and then uh, you can ask us questions on the Instagram live feed. Uh, so we'll do some rapid fire. We'll talk about uh, a couple of things. Uh, Floyd Money Mayweather for one. Uh, Conor McGregor, my boy. Very, very sad about the whole thing. Asian market, uh, Asian global market. And the watch, you know, Swiss exports, It's, it's they're, they're doing well. I believe they're up 13% actually. Uh, and, and precious metals are doing well too. It's kind of, uh, it's kind of crazy. So, uh, so we'll get into that. Uh, and then replica watches as well. Something that I've talked about before. I'm not gonna go into my opinion again. I highly recommend, you know, you take a look at a video we've made before on the topic. What about Hublot and Floyd? Yeah, so someone wants to know, what are my thoughts on, on, on Hublot? Hublot um, and Floyd Money Mayweather. Uh, I, I made a video about this uh, just now, uh, and we released it on Monday. Uh, so there's a link in the description below that you can go and click and, and watch my full thoughts uh, on the whole situation. But all in all, I, I get it. If I was Hublot, I'd do the same thing. I may have, I may have had better tactics, and I'll go into that in a second. Um, but I, I get what they're doing. They're trying to associate, you know, their brand uh, with not just success, but you know phenomenal success and, and, and the type and, and, the, and the culture of success that they want. You know, Hublot doesn't really fit, you know, beneath the cuff of, you know, um, Gordon Gecko kind of character. It doesn't work like that. That's a gold Rolex. But Hublot has figured out that it makes sense uh, if they say aggressive, taking people by the balls, beating the shit out of them. You know, not, not just like in a boxing match, but just as a whole. You know, I, once again, it's not so physical, but it's that I don't want to say barbaric, but it's that real aggressive, like masculine kind of success. Uh, that makes sense. So, I mean, good good for Hublot. Um, they were asked, I don't know if you guys saw this, they were asked if they if they care um, about the fact that, you know, Floyd Mayweather served, what, like 90 days in jail for beating the f*** out of his, not wife, but his daughter's mother. Uh, and, and, you know, Hublot totally distanced themselves. They were just like, um, well, you know, we don't know anything about his past, you know, personal life. It's not our business. <laughs> I was like, really? It's tough. Uh, most brands would distance themselves. I mean, Wheaties dropped, uh, you know, uh, Michael Phelps after he smoked a f***ing joint. You know, like, and, and I'm going to beat my wife and no one's going to drop me. That's pretty tough, man. Um, but, you know, they didn't. So good good for good for money. Hope he pays his taxes now. That'd be awesome. That was like $25 million in taxes. What a jerk off. I don't know you. You could be a great guy. He was actually a real gentleman in the fight last night. You know, wasn't too cocky. But, um, okay, great question. How do you go about explaining to your girlfriend you want to spend $3,500 on a watch? Um, you don't. You know, how serious of a relationship are you in? Like, mind your own business. You know, my money, like, it's, it's the same thing with her. Like, you know, if she thinks that you're a jerk off for doing that, then maybe she just doesn't like you. I would never let a friend, a girlfriend, anyone, you know, control what I was going to spend on something. Um, if they think that I'm irresponsible and they don't like me, then that's fine. And they just don't like me. Um, if they have a valid point that you shouldn't be spending three and a half thousand dollars, uh, they have no control over it, but they have a point, uh, you know, listen to them, you know, just like you would listen to your mom or your dad or your best friend or your financial advisor, you know, but, but to say, uh, you know, to say that I'm not going to buy a watch because my girlfriend doesn't want me to buy one, like, you know, no. My thoughts on the best world timer under 15,000, um, you know, I don't know, believe it or not. I read a lot about the Louis Vuitton World Timer. It's a very cool watch, all jokes aside. Um, and and I, I don't know if I, I, I know, I know I wouldn't buy one. I, I know I wouldn't. But if you really look into the watch, and I, I did it about a month ago, so I, I don't want to start like regurgitating, you know, false information on the watch. Um, but link, link to the video below. Um, in the description, so you guys can go ahead and, and watch the full video on it. But their world timers are phenomenal, and I think at like seven or eight thousand uh, dollars, it's not the hand painted version, uh, and it's not the white gold version. I think it's I think it's a it's a, it's a beautiful dial, but it's not hand painted, um, and it's in steel, and it's a really wonderful 
technically in-house manufacturer. Uh, so good for Louis. And honestly, there are a lot of, well, I don't say a lot, but I know a few like real watch, like collectors and fanatics, like big money people that own these fucking Louis Vuitton watches, which is hysterical. You know, I, people who people who buy the best, some of the best watches in the world, Eric Koo, just for example. I mean, this is a guy that owns, he has one of some of the best, you know, watch assets in the whole world. He owns Louis Vuitton World Timer. You know, it's it's a little bit of validation there. You know, it's saying, hey, I know it. it's weird to own this, but it really does represent value and it's worth my money. So, you know, good for him. Welcome back. I agree that you would not buy a watch from someone that is not a real watch manufacturer. Um, I, I don't know. I don't agree. I, I would. I mean, I bought my first watch from you know, Rolex. I mean, Ro Rolex was my, you know, my first watch that I purchased. So I, I felt like I, I lived the contradiction there. Um, but, but I think that it's fine. I think that, you know, if, if the company owns and they don't personally develop the movements, but there's nothing wrong with Louis Vuitton, you know, outsourcing. Well, not outsourcing. Acquiring a company that makes wonderful movements. I don't remember who it was. Um, but I don't know. I, I see no I see no conflict. I see no conflict. So. Have you ever purchased a replica by accident? What do you do to ensure you only buy genuine watches? Uh, good question. Have I ever? Yes, I, I purchased, I bought a fake, um, well, I actually had two bad experiences with Omega Rancheros, uh, but I bought a, a, a fake Omega Ranchero, um, geez, two years ago, basically in the first five months of Theo and Harris. Um, and I was gutted uh, when I found out. And I, luckily, I found out immediately after opening it up. I looked at it. I really started started inspecting it um, and, and doing like historical kind of like referencing. Luckily, what was fake about it was was kind of obvious. Um, you know, the, the, the movement was wrong. Um, the case was actually correct, but the dial was repainted, but it was done really well. I uh, It was it was scary. Shit. And when I figured it out that it was fake, you know, I... I I was like I said, I was gutted. You know, I, I didn't know what to do. It was off of eBay. You know, this is this is this is some scary typical eBay shit. Like a, probably a South American watch. Who knows in retrospect? I mean, but uh, but yeah, it was a scary moment. Anyway, I, I I sent it back and I got a full refund and all that stuff. It took about five months to get my money back though, which was a f mess. Uh, but I got my money back, so that was very, very good. Do you think there's a market for vintage pocket watches as there is for vintage uh, wrist watches? I bought a few, mostly long jeans, never sold them, found a collector. Um, you know, it's tough. I, I, you know, I, I don't really believe in the market for uh, pocket watches. I think that there are practical applications for them. I think that if you hang it on a desk, it's very interesting. I've seen pocket watches that I've been much more impressed by um, than you know their comparably priced you know kind of counterparts on the on the watch side, on the wristwatch side. They're just such poor residual value. Well, not poor residual value. That's not true at all. Uh, they are just not worth what they should be worth. If you consider their brands, consider their movements, uh, you consider the enameling on some of them. It's just. They should be worth a lot more. What do I think about the market for vintage pole routers? Um, so Universal Gen Universal Geneve pole routers used to be attainable. You know, mind you, I'm not an old man. I remember this two years ago uh, when I first started Theo and Harris. You used to be able to get a pole router for like 500 bucks. I, I bought several. Uh, it just so happened that the watches were well undervalued. Uh, and now you can get them in that... Fifteen hundred to three thousand dollar range, uh, truthfully, which is an incredible amount of money, and I don't think that they're too high yet. I, I you know, I think that three thousand is a lot of money, um, and, I, and I do, I wouldn't spend more than that um, on the watch. I don't think they'll go higher. But if you could pick up a pick up a, a you know a pull router at fifteen hundred or at eighteen hundred at twenty two hundred, I do think you will make money on that watch in the next year. Or, or who knows? It could, it could be, it could be longer than that, you know. But, but it's, it's, you know, it's true. What do you wear on your non-watch wrist? Uh, I wear um, uh, Rocky, uh, which is, uh, to my understanding, it's like a, it makes you a brother of, of, of somebody. You know, it's, it's Indian thing. It's a Hindi thing. Uh, so my, my best friends gave me this. She ties it around my arm four times a year uh, because she says I'm her brother and I love her very much. This is uh, my grandma's bracelet, uh, and after. 
uh, she passed. Uh, I haven't taken it off since. Uh, w what watches uh, do I think will be, uh, you know, will rise in, in value? That was a question I was asked two seconds ago. Uh, I think that Tudor has tremendous opportunity. I think that Tudor genuinely can be worth as on, on the normal level, I'm not talking about like extraordinary examples. I'm not talking about like crazy rare Tudor subs. I'm talking about vintage Tudor as a whole um, can ultimately and should ultimately be worth 20% uh, less than Rolexes, maybe. Um, you know, they're, they're comparable Rolexes. I'm talking about uh, Prince Oyster Dates versus Date Just. And honestly, most of that difference there, in my opinion, is because of size. Uh, it's not even because of the brand. Uh, to the Tudor brand is becoming stronger and stronger quarter after quarter. Every, every marketing effort that, that modern Tudor puts out there, you know, helps the vintage Tudor market. So in buying vintage Tudor, you are betting, you know, or you are investing in that company, or you're betting that because that company is doing so well, you think that your watch is going to you know, do better. Whereas with uh, Universal Geneve, for example, they're dead. They don't do watches anymore. So you're betting on bloggers, you know, which is tougher. You know, bloggers have no real interest in seeing a brand skyrocket. They just comment on it. You know, some, I mean, some bloggers do, particularly on Universal Geneve, but I mean, that doesn't, that, that's irrelevant. It's neither here nor there. But, uh, but when it's an actual brand that's doing really good things like Tudor, I think it's a safe bet. What do I think about the yellow gold uh, Daytona in the green dial? Uh, I think that it is one of the most ridiculous looking watches out there. Uh, I think that in a weird way, it's very Rolex. Uh, so it's like attractive in a very ugly way. But from a, design, like a, like a color point of view, I think it's hideous. I just happen to kind of like it which is embarrassing. Opinions on Musk de Cartier, uh, really good question. Uh, you guys should check out the live feed I did with Federico Iosa on Thursday. We talked about Cartier for a little while. It's a long video, it's like 25 minutes, but uh, we talked about Cartier for a little while and how it's interesting that in the vintage Cartier market, there is some inconsistency uh, in their watches. Some are you know, stamped Swiss, some are stamped Paris, some have this variation or this case, and there are fundamental similarities in their watches, but there's a lot of variation, which gets very confusing for a vintage watch person, you know, because in vintage watches, you're trying to authenticate uh, with with no authority, you, you have to do research and, and look for for you know other people having things, things like that. It, it's very difficult uh, to to do historical research in the vintage world. Uh, so Cartier is one of the hardest because their consistency isn't there. Um, so we're forced to you know work even harder. Unlike with Rolex, with Rolex, you know, authentic or not is obvious uh, or relatively obvious. Uh, so it's it's a much different ball game. So what's coming down the pike with new strap designs from TNH and Jean Rousseau? Uh, we will be uh, with Jean Rousseau this week designing our new straps, which will be released in October, I think, and I'm very excited. Uh, that doesn't mean to say that you should wait for those uh, because we have two Theo and Harris Jean Rousseau straps available in the watch shop right now, uh, actually on pre-order. So they are uh, they're phenomenal. They're, they're handmade. Uh, they are some of the most beautiful calf um, around. Honestly, they're... 20 or $30 less than our competitors, um, and the quality is not even comparable. Our, the quality of the straps that we had made with Jean Rousseau is incredible. Don't ask me. I mean, ask, ask anyone else who owns one. Uh, and if you wanna shoot me an email and, and you want a referral to someone who has one of the straps, like, do that. Because I'll refer you to 10 people who will say with no interest, that they have no interest in my company, um, that the straps blow your mind. I'm gonna to want to rant here um, for a second about the Swiss watch industry, uh, particularly how they've experienced this nosedive uh, for the past two years uh, in, in watch sales and watch exports. Um, and that's a huge problem. I think it's for two reasons. And I've gone into this before, but I'll do it briefly again. Uh, one, because their expectations were unrealistic. They were unfounded. I mean, there was really no reason to believe that, their, that the, the sales they were projecting were going to be able to be sustainable. Um, so that's a problem. So what they did was they made you know brands or they made uh, authorized dealers commit to you know purchasing X amount of watches because they believed they would sell them. Uh, but when they couldn't sell them, uh, they were just unloading onto a gray market. So for argument's sake, uh, let's say wholesale price is, is five bucks, suggested retail um, is ten, and they're not legally allowed to sell it below seven. They were selling at five and a half or at five uh, to, to other people, to people who had millions of dollars that they were gonna tie up in watches and then they were gonna sell those watches, uh, they're gonna try to at least, at six. 
Okay, but the problem is that these gray market dealers, now that they had these watches and they bailed, uh, they bailed so many authorized dealers out of serious trouble, now they're not obligated to sell this watch at any price. They could sell it however the fuck they want, you know, because they're not getting cut off from the manufacturer, uh, you know, if they're found out to be selling them at a low price. So uh, basically, the gray market, even though they were trying to help, or even though they were born, um, kind of by the request of authorized dealers, ended up killing authorized dealers because they had the ability to sell the watches at extremely low low prices. Uh, so they ruined, they cannibalized themselves basically. Beyond that, which I find even more interesting is the next point, um, their marketing is awful. Their messaging is so bad. There are two examples that I always use uh, of, of, of markedly better marketing. Uh, one was that Wild West movie. What was that Wild West cartoon with the watch? A wonderful, wonderful uh, video. Um, it was a short, short film. It was a cartoon. And, and it, long story short, it, it showed the connection between a man um, and his memory of his father in a watch. It talked not about the material, but it talked about the emotion, and that is what sells things, at least in my opinion. You know, it, it, how, how much longer are people gonna give a shit that Omega has a new movement, or Rolex did this, or Rolex did that? Ultimately, it's, it's, a, it's an emotional purchase, and that to me matters. Um, Non-watch geeks, the mass market, they care a little bit about technology and innovation in the watch industry, sure they do. But they're, it's not why they're buying. You know, they're not buying a Rolex because it's better than Omega. They're buying Rolex because they have an emotional attachment to it. You know, and I think that if these brands keep up with that and, and well, first of all, identify that's that's an important thing they're missing. You know, and then start executing on it, they will have. It'll be a, a, a monster. I think they'll have a massive resurgence uh, in sales and in long term um, ownership in the market. That's what's gonna change how the market is cut up. If they don't do it, then, then whatever, but that's it. Until, until they cut off the supply um, uh, to these gray market you know, parties uh, and really start communicating in a way that uh, speaks to people in a more passionate, emotional way, uh, if they can do that, they'll see a resurgence. And if they can't, then they're you know, in my opinion. But what brought me to this was in the last two months, there has been a rise uh, in sales in the Asian market. So good for them. Uh, but that's it, guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and sign off here. Thank you so much for watching this episode of Ask TNH Live. I had a ton of fun doing it. Uh, it's one of my favorite things. If you don't already follow us on Instagram, uh, go ahead and do that. At Theo and Harris. Uh, have an awesome Saturday, and I will speak to you guys, uh, you know, Monday.